Our scripture reading is going to be from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Please be seated. Please open your Bibles to the book of Philemon. Philemon is a letter from the Apostle Paul to a man named Philemon, his family, and the church in his home in Colossae. The other main character is a man named Onesimus. The theme of Philemon is forgiveness and reconciliation in Christ. Kids, I'm really glad y'all are in here this morning. Did you hear me say Philemon was about forgiveness and reconciliation in Christ? Let's talk about what they are. Maybe you can relate to this. If you come home and your mom tells you that your little brother broke your favorite toy, to forgive him is to tell him it's okay and to not be mad about it anymore. Forgiveness is a choice you make. It's about what you do. But that doesn't mean you like him or want to play with him. Reconciliation is when your little brother tells you he is very sorry and it was an accident. He might offer to help you buy a new toy and you can tell that he wants to make it right with you. To be reconciled to him is to tell your little brother that you love him and you want to play with him again. Reconciliation, reconciliation is a choice you both make and your relationship is restored. When we read Philemon, we'll learn about something, that something happened between Philemon and Onesimus. It wasn't a broken toy. It was a lot more serious than that. Paul is trying to get Philemon to forgive Onesimus and be reconciled to him. And he keeps bringing up Jesus. And why does he do that? We're going to talk about it. Back to our story. Paul doesn't give us a lot of details about what happened. This is one of the challenges we have when we try to understand Paul's letters. I found a good explanation about what it's like and some encouragement for us. Reading the letters can be like listening to half of a telephone conversation. We hear only the writer's response to the situation in a particular church. Still, we trust that God and his goodness has given us all we need to know in order to interpret the letters adequately and to apply the lessons faithfully. Indeed, God has given us his word, the Bible, to help us interpret Philemon. Before we go further, please bow your heads and pray with me. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning and worship you and to seek to understand what you would have us learn from the book of Philemon. Thank you for giving us your word, and I pray that through the help of the Holy Spirit that you will bless us with understanding this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. To help us understand Philemon, to set the stage for the letter that we're about to read, we're going to go back to the book of Acts. In Acts 19, we read about Paul traveling to and ministering in Ephesus. Ephesus was a port city in what was known as Asia and what we know now as Turkey. When Paul arrived, he found some disciples who had been baptized in John's baptism. Then Paul shared the gospel with them. And we read in verses 5 through 7 of Acts 19, On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. This was the beginning of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. For three months he spoke in the synagogue. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, 
He took the disciples with him and reasoned daily in the hall of Tyrannus. Acts 19.10 reads, This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. We believe Paul was in Ephesus from A.D. 52 through 55. Now, I hope you're saying, but Heath, you said Philemon and his church were in Colossae. Why are we talking about Ephesus? I'm glad you noticed that. If you look at a map, and maybe you have one in your Bible, you'll see Ephesus on the coast of Asia, and about 100 miles east, you'll find the city of Colossae. So when we read that all of the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, that includes the Ephesians and the Colossians. Several years later, Paul writes the letter to Philemon, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see that this is a letter from Paul and that he is a prisoner. Timothy is helping Paul write the letter. We believe that Paul is a prisoner in Rome and that he wrote this letter in A.D. 62. If you remember our study of Acts, the book ends with Paul under house arrest in Rome. And I'll read verses 30 and 31 of Acts 28. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So Paul is writing this letter and he writes to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our beloved fellow soldier, and the church in your house. We believe that Apphia is probably Philemon's wife, and Archippus is probably his son. The mention of Archippus is our first clue that they're in Colossae, because Archippus is mentioned in the book of Colossians. Then we have Paul's greeting in verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we start reading verse 4, I want us to skip down and read verses 23 and 24. And here's why. These verses will help us understand the timeline and the context of Philemon. The rest of the letter will paint the picture of forgiveness and reconciliation in Christ. And once we start on that, I don't want to have to get back into the context. So verses 23 and 24 of Philemon read, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Epaphras is mentioned twice in the book of Colossians. From the middle of verse 6 and through verse 7 of chapter 1 we read, Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. In chapter 4 of Colossians, Paul calls Epaphras one of you. Epaphras was a Colossian, and we believe that he traveled to Ephesus during Paul's ministry there and was saved. Then he went back to his hometown of Colossae to share the gospel and plant the church. Epaphras was probably the one who shared the gospel with Philemon, and he has continued his ministry by traveling with Paul and is now a prisoner in Rome. In chapter 4 of Colossians, we also hear about Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, the same ones from verse 24 of Philemon that we just read. Colossians 4, 7 through 9 reads, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Tychicus is also mentioned in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 21 and 22. So that you may also know how I am doing and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. We're going to continue reading Philemon, but before we do, let's do a quick recap. Paul lived and ministered in Ephesus for two and a half years, preaching the gospel. A Colossian named Epaphras came to Ephesus and was saved. Epaphras went back home to Colossae preached the gospel, and helped plant the church. A Colossian named Philemon was saved. Years later, we have Philemon and the letters to the Ephesians and Colossians. Paul talks about being a prisoner in all three letters. There's a lot of overlap in the people who are mentioned in the letters. We believe 
They were written about the same time, and all three were delivered by Tychicus and Onesimus. Now I'm going to read verses 4 through 7 of Philemon. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. This is very high praise coming from Paul. We don't believe Paul has ever met Philemon, but he is certainly familiar with the work that he's doing in Colossae. There are two things I want us to, to think about here. The first is the sharing of your faith from verse 6. Paul says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Sharing of your faith could mean a lot of things. You can share your faith verbally, by your actions towards others. It could describe most of your Christian walk. Then Paul prays that the sharing of your faith may become effective. And the timing there is open-ended, referring to what Philemon has done, is doing, and what he will do in the future. And Paul concludes this idea by writing, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. When we talk about Christ and the good things we have because of him, we're talking about life itself, peace, purpose, and our future in heaven. The second thing I want us to pay attention to is in verse 7. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Paul is commending Philemon's work and talking about the benefits to the church. We're going to read more about hearts and refreshing as we continue. Now let's continue and read verses 8 through 16. This is the meat of the letter. We'll start to understand what happened between Philemon and Onesimus. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me, in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but much more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Starting in verse 8, Paul says he is bold enough in Christ to command Philemon to do what is required. But we're not going to be able to piece that together just yet. Instead, Paul says to Philemon in verse 9, Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. And continuing in verse 10, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. This is a big piece of the puzzle right here. Paul is saying that in Rome, where he is a prisoner, that he led Onesimus to Christ, and Onesimus is now a Christian. This is pretty incredible. And we'll learn why here soon. In verse 11, Paul writes, Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. This is another big piece of the puzzle. The name Onesimus means useful or profitable and was frequently given to bondservants. So what is a bondservant? It is similar to a slave in that he is bound to serve his master for a specific and usually lengthy period of time. But it is different than a slave because a bondservant might own property, advance socially, and even be released or purchase his freedom. But nothing in this letter leads us to believe that Onesimus was released from his service to Philemon and his family, nor did he purchase his freedom. He had broken Roman law by fleeing, and the penalty for such an act would be severe punishment or even death. Let's keep reading in verse 12. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Sending him back to you. Yes, you read that correctly. Paul wrote the letter in Rome, needed someone to deliver it, and who better than Onesimus? If you look at a map, you'll appreciate the distance Onesimus traveled, both to escape from Philemon and to return to him. 
It's more than a thousand miles each way, a journey that would take months. Paul finished the verse describing what he was doing as sending my very heart. Paul has fatherly love for Onesimus and wants to impress that on Philemon. Paul continues in verses 13 and 14. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. This is one of the reasons this letter is about forgiveness and reconciliation. Paul says, he might serve me on your behalf. Paul is not asking Philemon to dissolve his relationship with Onesimus. He wants him to be reconciled. He might not want the same type of relationship as before, but he wants there to be peace between them. And he's asking Philemon, not telling him. In verses 15 and 16, we read, For this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What does Paul mean by taking a passive voice here? I believe he's looking at at the big picture, seeing God's hand in all of this, and how could he not? Let's remember, Onesimus flees Colossae, travels over a thousand miles to the most populous city in the Roman Empire and just happens to find Paul and believe in Jesus? We can definitely see God's hand in this. And Paul describes the potential results of God's act in the rest of the verse. Paul says that in light of Onesimus' conversion and service to the gospel, that his relationship might change with Philemon, that he might be more than a bondservant to him, that he is a beloved brother in Christ. Now let's read verses 17 through 20. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Here's Paul's big ask. And another big clue to what happened. Verse 17 reads, So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If we're in this gospel business together, I want you to welcome Onesimus the same way you would welcome me. This is a big ask, even bigger when you read the next verse. I'll continue in verse 18. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. So it looks like Onesimus stole from Philemon when he left. And that probably helped him get to Rome. This theft would make his punishment even more severe under Roman law. But Paul makes a pretty convincing argument in verses 19 and 20. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Paul volunteers to pay Onesimus' debt himself, but quickly compares that debt to the debt Philemon owes Paul. Paul was instrumental in sending the gospel to Colossae so that Philemon was saved. Paul sums it up at the end of verse 20 when he writes, Refresh my heart in Christ. Back in verse 7, Paul says that through the work Philemon has been doing in the church in Colossae, that the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. He comes back to that language here regarding Onesimus. Philemon has an opportunity to forgive and be reconciled to Onesimus. Christ is the model he is to follow. The forgiveness we have in Christ, the reconciliation we have to God through Christ, should inform Philemon's response to Onesimus. Let's continue reading in verses 21 and 22. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Paul continues his persuasion telling Philemon he knows he will exceed his expectations and then that he hopes to visit him someday. We already went through verses 23 and 24 and the letter concludes with verse 25 which reads, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So what happens when the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with our spirit? We look at life differently. I said that the theme of Philemon was forgiveness and reconciliation in Christ. 
The reason that Paul mentions Jesus so often is because he wants Philemon to remember what he has in Christ and to act accordingly. Paul wants Philemon to forgive Onesimus. And I think that's what he means in verse 8 when he says, Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Philemon is required to forgive Onesimus. Why? Because God has forgiven him through Christ. And that's why I had Josh read the Lord's Prayer in the follow-up verse. We have to forgive others their trespasses as our Heavenly Father has forgiven us. Then there's reconciliation. Paul wants them to be reconciled. We can't know by reading the letter, but what do you think Onesimus did when he delivered it? It's safe to assume that he asked Philemon to forgive him, told him he was sorry. I'm sure Philemon wanted to know about the journey he had been on. I'm sure Philemon was overjoyed that Onesimus was now a Christian. Philemon and Onesimus were now on the same team, team gospel. Philemon opened his home to the Colossian church and Onesimus was serving Paul. Paul probably wanted Onesimus to continue serving him, just like he mentioned in verse 13. Maybe that's what he meant when he said in verse 21, confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing you will do even more than I say. Maybe Paul told Onesimus, If Philemon will forgive you and free you, please thank him and tell him I'd like you to come back and help me. Philemon also paints a beautiful picture of the gospel. Onesimus sinned against Philemon. He stole from him and ran away, and according to the law, he deserved to be punished severely. Like Onesimus, we have sinned against God. In thought, word, and deed, we have disobeyed and broken his law. As it is written in Ephesians 2, verse 3, we are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. God led Onesimus to Paul, who shared the life-saving message of the gospel to Onesimus. God led us to Christ in the life-saving message of the gospel. As Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Just like Onesimus, God opened our eyes to the gospel and we were saved, as it is written in Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Paul then sought to reconcile Onesimus and Philemon to restore their relationship. In the same way, through Christ, we are reconciled to God, as it is written in Ephesians 2, verses 6 following, that this is what God did, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And what then? How are we to think about this, and what are we to do? as it is written in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are to be thankful for God's grace and then to go and glorify him by our good works. In Christ... Onesimus is a new creation, just as Ben read before in 2 Corinthians 5. Brothers and sisters, if you haven't believed in Jesus for salvation, you're in trouble. Just like the rest of us, you've sinned, broken God's laws, and deserve punishment. Some of this punishment you might experience here on earth, but the punishment you should fear most is in eternity. The Bible says that when we die, every single one of us will be resurrected. We will live again with physical bodies, and there will be a judgment. Sinners will be punished severely for eternity in hell. But Heath, I thought you said we were all sinners. What's the difference? The difference is Jesus Christ, our only hope. Through Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself, to all who would believe. We read in 2 Corinthians that, For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin even though he knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. Brothers and sisters, when you believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven and you are reconciled to God. 
God sent Jesus to live the perfect life that we could not live. God sent Jesus to die on the cross, and Jesus rose from the grave and ascended into heaven to be with God the Father. And that is our hope when we believe in Jesus. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Let us pray.